If you're fans of Thundercats, these gentlemen are legends and have done so much to shape all of our childhoods. I'd like to bring out Larry Kenny and Peter Newman. Come on out, guys. Hey, fans. This panel recording is sponsored by those cool cats over at 80stees.com. Your source for shirts that show your love of all things 80s, like Thundercats. And you can use coupon code FSCAST to get 30% off your next order. Even Silverhawk shirts. Head on over to ADCs.com and enjoy this panel. So, of course, Larry is known as Lionel, Lord of the Thundercats. Thank you. Oh, there you go. And now among other voices, no, he's Bluegrass you. on Silverhawks. He was Claudius in the 2011 Thundercats. JB Cripps in Red Dead. Wow. Um, Sonny from Cocoa Puffs, Count Chocula, plus a number of other roles. And then there's Peter, who's uh, like the voice of Tigra, Wiley Cat, a bunch of other voices on Quicksilver in Silver Hawks. I mean, my God. Uh, Major Nikolai Jakov in Archer. <laughs> I called him Major Yakov. I, I can't Jack take off, responsibility Jack for all what they, you know. <laughs> the Darkling in the Darkness too. Give a big round of applause, please. <laughs> now this is your time. Tom is going to run around with a microphone for questions. And I see we already have one. Larry, Gentlemen? Uh, as we rehearsed, uh, let's do the... When somebody loves you. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a different show. That's a, that's a, that's different, a different show. show. Sorry, sorry. Guys, if, do you want to sit down, stand? What do you Are guys want? Are you kidding? Want? We've been sitting for 14 hours. <laughs> all right, we're going to stand up. So, all right. Sure. So, Let's all stand up. No, <laughs> everybody stand up. Stand up, sit down. Stand up. Sit. <laughs> so before we get to your question, which we're going to come to very shortly, I just would like to know, what got you guys into voice acting? Peter, do you want to start us off? Uh, well, I... Um uh, it's, listen, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I was a uh, young man at loose ends in my life, and uh, somebody who knew me quite well said, you know those silly voices that you do? People make a living doing that. I said, yeah, right, walked away, and eventually I got the idea that that could be true. I was then introduced to an agent, and the agent uh, guided me through putting together a demo reel, which in those days was actually actually reel-to-reel -reel tape, audio tape. Uh, some of the older people explained it to some of the younger people, please. And they were kind enough to give me a boost. And they introduced me to another agent who started sending me out on auditions. And I was, I guess, lucky enough to get the first audition I went on. It was the voice of a parrot for a little dairy chain out in the Midwest. Uh, I describe that I always think of that as the gods of commercials going fishing and, you know, setting the hook. Because <laughs> I thought, oh, this is easy. I'm going to do this. No problem. And then I had to learn the business, of course. But it was too late by then. I was hooked, and uh, that's how I got there. Can, can you still do the voice of the parakeet? No. It's too, <laughs> too late for that. That's gone. By the way, reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape, there's magnetic tape. Anyway, Larry, <laughs> yes. what, what got you into acting and voice uh, acting? Well, I started my career in radio, as a matter of fact, uh, in Peoria, Illinois, where I'm from. And I, nobody in Peoria here, I guess. Uh, as I was 15 years old and got a job as a, a disc jockey. Not a DJ, like today, but a disc jockey. We actually played records on the radio and... And I always, did, um, I always did little crazy cartoon voices on my show, little comedy routines. And I kept doing that at different radio stations across the country until I got to New York. And then uh, the world kind of, of commercials kind of opened up for me. Uh, I was the voice of Count Chocula for 40 years and the voice of Sonny the Cocoa Puffs Bird for 40 years. And of course, Lion O and, and Thundercats and Bluegrass and Silverhawks and all that kind of stuff. But that's how I got started in radio. Very cool. Now, you were his boss in Thundercats, but you were his boss in Silverhawks. That's right. How did that dynamic work? Well, I, got, uh, I took revenge for all the stuff he had done to me in Thundercats, <laughs> uh, naturally. <laughs> now, I believe we had a question over here. Tom, if you would uh, 
Be my mic man. I appreciate there you go. it. <laughs> Before Thundercats, how much did you know about Rankin Bass? Well, I knew about Rankin Bass like most other people. I grew up watching their uh, their holiday special cartoons. Um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, Frosty the Snowman with, yep. uh, who was it, Fred Astaire in that one, wasn't it? I, yeah, and maybe. Who was it? Was, was Jimmy Durante? That's right, he was, yeah. So I remembered those. Uh, every year I would watch the Rankin and Bass yeah. Christmas, com- uh, Christmas animated specials. And then along came Thundercats, and I went for the audition, and I saw at the top of the page Rankin Bass Productions. And I thought, oh, my God, I hope I get this. Because I, you know, what a thrill to yeah. watch them when you were a kid and then grow up and, and, and work for them. And that's what happened. Yeah, that's true. It's basically the same thing. Uh, other than having watched those holiday specials, that stop action uh, animations uh, that they did, uh, I knew nothing else about them. Uh, and so, just like Larry, who went to this office to do voices, silly voices for them, and uh, uh, you know, who you know, a couple of days later, find out uh, got the job, and turned into all of this, unbelievably, for Rankin Bass. Yeah. Excuse me, but my wife tells me I need to learn how to use a microphone. <laughs> Were yeah. you a voice at? A You're right. voice at? Mm-hmm. Apparently, I was pulling it away like this. When I was walking. <laughs> Larry, I keep trying yeah, just, to just, tell you. Just a little closer. I know. I know. It just doesn't. Uh, it doesn't help. What can I do? <laughs> I mean, well, never mind. <laughs> Another question. Anybody? Ooh, we got this guy's hand popped right up. Oh, and we got this young gentleman here, so you'll be next, sir. What was your when you got the role of Lionel? Uh, I'm sorry. What can was you... your reaction when you got the voice of Lionel? Oh, when you well, what were your reactions you when you got the role for Lionel? Yeah. Oh. And for you, for Tigra. Oh, yeah. when I when I got the role, when, what was your reaction when you got it? Larry? Like, oh, it was something like. Ah! He wants to know what was your reaction ah. when you got the roll with the butter on. No, I mean with the lo- for lion. Oh, that that. Oh, I was extremely. Ex- I was extremely excited, extremely happy. No, I was. It was really a shock. And uh, for one thing, uh, if you recall, Peter, uh, up until Thundercats, there had been no major animated shows recorded in New York City. They were all done out in California. Disney, Warner Brothers. All those old cartoons and things were all done in California. So none of us expected to be auditioning for an animated series in New York. And uh, let alone get, get the job, you know. So uh, it was really exciting. I, uh, I don't think I slept for a couple of days. <laughs> what was your reaction when you got cast as Tigra? Uh, well, other than doing the kind of helter-skelter audition in the office, in Rankin Bass's office, uh, which my recollection is they didn't even record it. They just said, oh, we're looking for this kind of character, we're looking for that kind of character, what do you think, what have you got? And then we got, I got, got the job, whatever that job was going to be exactly, uh, and then we went to the studio, and we were basically auditioning in the studio. Here's the character, this is what he looks like, what do you guys think? And everybody would take a shot at it, and the director and producer on the other side of the glass uh, would decide who got the the character. And whenever you would get a character, you'd be thrilled about it because it meant you really had the job. (laughs) Because otherwise, who knew what what might happen? Uh, So whenever you uh, were chosen to do a particular character, it just meant, meant you would continue to be part of this project yeah so I believe we got a question with this gentleman right here all right hopefully I have usually a prop too there we go all right um, so we're at a toy convention I figured this would be appropriate how cool was it when your characters became an action figure and did you get one at the time and do you still have them <laughs> Well, um, we, my recollection, first recollection is we went to that toy fair. Uh, we went to the toy fair for the Thundercats toys yeah. when they first developed them. Toy fair, We yeah. got to see the prototypes <clears throat> when they first produced them. 
and so it was just a great thrill to walk through and see these characters and it, you know kind of goes to your head a little bit it's great yeah. fun it's it's very uh, flattering uh, but then I never I never bought them I never had them till years later long after we had done the work and it was off the air as you remember Thundercats was off the air for quite a long time my wife and I were walking through a KB toy stores if any of you remember that looking for gifts for relatives and in this sad little bin in the middle of the floor the sale bin were Thundercat figures and I, I felt like I had to rescue some of them so I got them with the KB you know 298 sticker on them or something I still have some of them <laughs> well my first uh, as I recall my first reaction to the seeing the Lion-O figure was it doesn't even look like me I mean, the guy's got red hair, and it's just, that's just, and then they told me he's not supposed to look like you. You're supposed to sound like him. Uh, it, it, was, it, was really, it was really cool, though, too. You know, I mean, Peter and I stand here and talk about, this was all 40 years ago, you know, and um, we had no way of knowing back, the, back then if the show was even going to be on the air more than a few weeks. You have no idea until the, the ratings come and things like that. And then they, they ordered 13 more shows, and you record 13 more shows. So, um, people ask me all the time, did you, did you ever have an idea that it was going to be this big, be, become iconic? There was no way we could have known. Because you can, have, you can have the best actors in the world, and I think we had a cast of some of the best actors in the world. We had a great director, we had, uh, the animators were fantastic. Everything about the show, the music was fantastic. And we all knew that. The writing was fantastic. But you never know what can happen. If you have all those elements are perfect, different things can happen that don't allow the show to be a hit. The network it's on may not, may not promote it properly. They may put it on and give it a bad airtime. They might put it on at midnight on Sundays or something like that. Uh, and then there goes your show. So there was no way we could have predicted that we'd be here standing here 40 years later ask, answering your questions about this show. Thank you. Hi. Um, that was a nice going into a segue from that, that you had some of the best cast in the world. Um, I remember one of your uh, co-stars was Bob McFadden. And yeah, he had a great career uh, in voice acting well before Thundercats. And I was surprised to learn that he actually worked on another show that was a childhood favorite of mine. Maybe you heard of it called Ultraman. Did he ever share with you stories of working on that show at all? Like any of the experiences he had with it and what it was like to work on that one? He probably did, but I don't remember. Yeah. And working with Bob McFadden was like working with 10 different people. He was so talented, uh, not just his voices, but he had been, a, I remember seeing Bob McFadden on the Ed Sullivan show when I was a kid. Uh, he, used to do, he used to do character voices and sound effects and all that kind of thing. Bob McFadden, who played Snarf on Thundercats, a lot of people, no, no, Mumbra was Earl Hammond, yeah. Uh, but, but Bob McFadden was Snarf on the show, and I forget who he was on, on Silverhawks. Do you remember who he was on Silverhawks? I yeah, I, I don't either. <laughs> but he was also... Uh, I'll look of, on IMDb. Yeah, check it out. He did the voice of uh, Frankenberry Serial. You remember? Uh, Frankenberry Serial. Uh, with strawberry-flavored marshmallows. That was Bob. So he and I yeah, worked Boris together Carlo. for years and years because in the, in the early days, I'm talking about the, <clears throat> about the late 70s, uh, we wouldn't do an individual Count Chocula commercial and an individual Frankenberry. They put us together and they called it the, um, the monster cereals. It was Frankenberry, Count Chocula, and Boo Berry. You remember Boo Berries? Then they added Yummy Mummies and stuff like that. Blueberries, yeah, that's right. Bob was great. He was a funny guy. Yeah. The, uh, just, if I could, just a, a quick story that Bob told when he uh, did a, I think it was a radio commercial, and the producers, he heard them talking about that they needed the sound of a, a pack of baying hounds, right, the dogs. Yeah. And Bob said, oh, I can do that. And he, and he did, and he demonstrated, you know, it sounded like when he did it, it sounded like all these dogs. And, and the producer was very happy with it. And they said, oh, that's great, Bob. And, and he said, well, you know, um, 
you'll have to you have to pay me another session fee for the sound of the dogs and the producer you know kind of oh really I do and Bob's response was well you're lucky normally I charge by the dog <laughs> I remember that yeah. and he also uh, he, the guy would say the guy said uh, can you do some dogs and Bob would say how many dogs are in the, are in the pack and the guy said three, three, three dogs so I can't do it the way you did it, but, but Bob would do, and it would sound like three dogs. And the guy would say, okay, now give me seven dogs. And it sounded like seven dogs. It was the most the craziest thing I ever heard. Yeah. He was, uh, he was quite a guy, quite a guy. And loved sharing his talents. Always happy to share his talent. And Bob had these funny little... Um, On like, Silverhawks, by the way, he was Commander Stargazer, Steel Will, Hardware, Steel Will. and the Professor. Yeah. Bob had the funniest, he would break us up with these, these little subtle things that he would do. Like, we would do a take, do a whole page, and then we'd look into the, through the glass where all the company people were, the producers and the directors, just, you know, to get their opinion. Did, did they like it? Did they like it? And Bob, would, Bob would look over and he'd go, Mother, they hated it. <laughs> And if you, made a, if you made a mistake, if you fluffed one of your lines, Bob would say, Have you no skill in your craft? <laughs> he was hilarious. Yeah. I, I think we had a question over here with this gentleman. I, I know you both have been here previously over the years, numerous times. What is your observation of the growth of RetroCon here in Oaks over the years and your feeling on the growing legacy of, you know, Thundercats. I, I know I've watched my son develop and grow with it and it's become part of who he is in many respects. So I'm curious about your observation on that metamorphosis, I guess, over time. Yeah. I, I, the last time I was here at RetroCon was 2014. So for me, it's like this sudden, you know, change. I didn't see the gradual evolution. So I get here today and it's by comparison, now it's this huge hall oh, yeah. with all these vendors and all these guests. My understanding, this is like a record breaking year for the number of guests uh, that have come. Uh, so it's, you know, it's amazing to see that. Yeah. It's amazing to see that. And then meeting the fans who are coming up and, and they're, some of them, you know, some of you have brought your kids, some kids along, and the, how they're, they seem to be getting uh, involved in it. Um, it's, it's just remarkable. It just puts a smile on your face because part of what we did, part of what was done with Thundercats was to make sure that it was a, a positive message. As, as we've explained uh, to other people, uh, there was a psychologist attached to the project who reviewed all the scripts to make sure there was a positive message and a positive vibe and as some, some fans have commented, Thundercats were like a family. These characters worked like a family. They'd have spats, and, but they'd always have each other's backs. Uh, so it's, it's great to see. Very heartwarming. Yeah. I was at the very first RetroCon. I forget what the year was. 12? 2012, was it, huh? 10 years ago, Larry. 2012. Yeah. 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 Thank you. My wife remembers more than I do. <laughs> of course, I'm a lot older than she is, so... It's easier for her. Uh, yeah, I was here at the very first one, and as I recall, they held it in a store. There were still people shopping in this store, something like a store, and I was the only person there signing autographs, which was cool, you know, because people would come by and say, I could hear the wife say, should we get this guy's autograph? <laughs> Why not? Is the only one here. And uh, so I've been here a total of Maybe five times, but the last time I was here, it was about 2017. Uh, okay. I couldn't believe today when I walked in the size of the thing. Uh, which reminds me, I want to thank Rosemary Ward Tusky and her husband, Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't married when I first did the show here with them. Yep. But they've done such an incredible job of putting this thing together. This is, this is one of the largest crowds I've seen at any, any Comic-Con I've done in a long time. Yeah. Today's crowd, it's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. 
And we, we love you for coming. Thank you. Boy, Larry, what a cheap way to get us a round of applause. I know, I know. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Remember that. Whenever there's a lull, you say, you know, people, you're the, this is the greatest audience in the world. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. There you go. All kinds of ways. Um, quick question, though. I mean, on Thundercats, you basically were Tom Hanks and Big. You, were, you started out, you were a kid, and suddenly you were in an adult body. And you were the wiser but subordinate guy. How did you work out that dynamic? Uh, with great difficulty, he was a real punk kid. You know what I mean? I want to tell you. No, it was, it, it was just we were given such great direction by the wonderful Lee Daniker. Um, yeah. And so the scripts told us who we were at, at, any, you know, at any given moment in the story. And remember, Lionel went through the anointment, whatever that, that the yeah. series of episodes. The trials. The trials, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we were just actors. We had our scripts. Uh, we had a great director. And that's, that's what told us what the relationship would be. And then it was our job to give that life, to give that yeah. voice. Literally, yeah. give it voice. Yeah. Any other questions, please? We, we have that gentleman back there. <clears throat> Him. Hi, Larry. Hi, Peter. So I just wanted to ask you about... Hold it a little closer. Hold, hold the mic right. close to your mouth. All right, thanks. Not about don't, don't do it too well because we don't need the competition. All right. Not about thunder. Carol, cats, but show him how to hold the microphone, will you? Oh, yeah, maybe you should. Uh, am I doing it right? Yeah. All right. About another Rankin Bass series. I wanted to ask you. I'm pleased to. Okay. Pleased to either of you have the show, the the comic strip, you know, the one from 1987, the last series they did. No, I think most of it is lost media now, but... You know, do you I'm, I'm not... Is, there the, is the mic okay? I'm not quite getting... I'm hearing you coming and going a little bit. Check, check. Yeah. Just a little... Project a little louder, because it's, it's, it's a little harder to hear, right. especially with the music out there. Yeah. How much of it did you hear? So, um, okay, I wanted to ask you guys, what memories do you have of working on Rankin Bass's last cartoon, the, the comic strip? from 1987. Yeah. yeah. The, the comic strip, yeah. right? That's a comic yeah. strip, yeah. That was the Saturday morning thing. Yeah. It was four shows, four 15-minute yeah. shows put together for a two-hour show. Yep. Uh, it was Mini Monsters, Karate Cat. Mini Monsters, Karate Cat, Tiger uh, Sharks. Ti Tiger Sharks, Tiger yeah. Shark. And the one other one, I forget. What was it? I'm glad you guys are here because I can't remember anything. Yeah, me too. Karate Cat, Street Frogs, Tiger Sharks, Street Frogs, Tiger Sharks. Yeah, Mini and Mini Monsters. Frogs. Yeah, I know. Well, we weren't all on all th all those shows. Like I think I was only on. Um, uh, I know I was on Karate Cat. Anybody remember Karate Cat? Well, Bob McFadden was Karate Cat. Kiao, baby. Remember that? Kiao, baby. I played a character called Boom Boom Burmese. This That's enormous awesome book. fat <laughs> cat who talked like this. You better watch out, Karate, because Big Mama's coming. You know? So I was on that one and maybe Mini Monsters. I don't remember. I, was, I know I was on Mini Monsters and Tiger Sharks. Oh. Um, I have n almost no recollection of the voices I did for Tiger Sharks. I really, I just don't remember. Uh, Tiger uh, Sharks? Yeah, Tiger Sharks. Oh, that's right, I was on that too. Um, I, I played Dolph on that. Uh, Tiger Sharks was half fish, half human. <laughs> right. yeah. That was the last attempt Rankin Bass made to, to do an animated series with half human, half something else. And I played a character named, his name was Dolph. What kind of fish you suppose he was? A dolphin! Right, this is a smart <laughs> crowd. This is a very smart crowd. Not a shark. And they kind of talk like this, you know. Of course, with the, why he had an Irish accent, I have no idea. But he did. I, I, do, have, I do have memories from Camp Minimon. The, the Minimon, yeah, Camp Minimon it was. <clears throat> because I, I, the characters, I got to pull characters out of the classic films, the black and white films. Um, uh, 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 the, the camp... 
uh, camp, the camp supervisor was a silhouette, the silhouetted <laughs> figure up on a tower, making the announcements for the camp. Oh, good morning, camp. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be a wonderful day. Uh, and th- I, then there was a little mummy, Mummo, who was wrapped in bandages that were always t- kind of trailing behind him. And I thought of him as like Leo Gorsi uh, from the Dead End Kid. <laughs> yeah, sure, that's right. Yeah, we're going to have a great time today. Yeah. Because <laughs> he wore boxing gloves. So yeah. that I remember. You know, I, this just occurred to me for the f- first time ever. I don't know why, but... Uh, you know, you folks ask us questions. A lot of times, we don't remember the exact episode, <laughs> and we know you do. <laughs> you know, and because some people ask questions like, uh, Larry, in uh, episode 127. And I go, oh, jeez, here we go. <laughs> no, wait a minute, Larry. Episode 127, I'll never forget. lion comes walking through the door with a sword in his left hand. <laughs> now he comes out the door... The sword's in his right hand. What's that all about, Larry? <laughs> I don't know. But what occurs to me now is that most of you were watching this show when you were kids. We were 35-year-old people doing this show. So we didn't see it the same way that you did. Now, to us, the nostalgia is, is what a great time we had doing it. You know, and, but for you guys, the nostalgia is it was such a, such a great part of your childhood... And just like us, with um, Looney Tunes cartoons and, yeah. and things like that, and, um, yeah. the Marx Brothers and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Kukla, uh, Fran, and Ollie. Kukla, Fran, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. <laughs> How about that Fran, huh? Uh, yeah, that's... So the, the nostalgia is different. You know, we remember it as having a great time doing a show that we had no idea would become iconic. And for you, your memories are more cherished, I think, because it was uh, it happened during the best part of your life. And I think any of us, if we've been fortunate to have a, a nice, a good childhood, you'll never have memories like the kind you had when you were a kid. I, so I guess that, that just occurred to me. Uh, we're, it's like we're basking in the glow of your sentimental recollections of it, your nostalgia. And we, and we appreciate it. God, uh, you are a suck-up, aren't you? Oh, yeah. You really are. Thank you. That's the nicest thing anyone said to me. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we have a question back here. Okay, so I have a joke question and a real question for Mr. Kenny. Um, did General Mills give you free Cocoa Puffs? I'm sorry? Did General Mills ever give you free Cocoa Puffs? When did, you do <laughs> did they give me free Cocoa Puffs? <laughs> no. Um... I, at least I never asked for any, so they probably would have in the early days. Now, I remember, uh, when I say the early days of doing commercials, for me it was, I began in, in New York in 1974. And back at that time, if you, were, if you were doing a commercial for a major company like that, they often would send you cases of it, whenever you wanted it. If you wanted a case of Cocoa Puffs, they would send it to you. Okay, now uh, for, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, now for the serious question. Yeah, okay. How much fun was it playing Sonny on those Cocoa Puff commercials? How, how much fun was it playing Sonny? Yeah, on those Cocoa Puff commercials. Oh, it was wonderful! <laughs> it was a fun character to do because he was just, well, he was crazy. You know, bouncing. I'm, you, I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Up here, I will go cuckoo for my favorite cereal. Yahoo! Cocoa Puffs! <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Now I want breakfast. I, I did, uh, I, I had for, for whatever time it was on the air, uh, I got to be Inspector Clouseau for Owens Corning fiberglass insulation. And no, they did not come and insulate my house. Just to make a comment on it. <laughs> I, All right, uh, we have I, a question over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. In that same area. Uh, when I first started doing Comic Cons, I would bring empty boxes of c- Count Chocula boxes and Cocoa Puff boxes and sign autographs on those if people wanted that. Remember I, what I used to do is I would go buy 25 boxes of Cocoa Puffs, 25 boxes of Count Chocula, <laughs> dump them all out, flatten the box, and put them in my suitcase. 
one day, I forget who it was, some guy from General Mills was at the Comic-Con. And he walks over and he's, I'm telling him the story. I said, I, you know, I empty them out. And he said, Why, if you called me, I would send you a thousand of them empty. And you wouldn't. But I, I can't imagine how much Cocoa Puffs and Count Chocula I dumped in the garbage. <laughs> Which, looking back on it, was probably the best thing to do with Count Chocula. A lot of sugar. So I'm sorry, somebody else had a question. I, I don't have so much of a question as I was following up my man's question to you. I just realized recently, I was watching Thundercats and. I went to IMDb, and that's where I learned you were Doll from Tiger Sharks, which is a show I loved as a kid. And it, as sorry. soon as it appeared, it disappeared. But Peter was Mako. He was your boss in that show, too. Yes, that's right. That's right. And, uh, that's why I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Silverhawks, you're saying? I was yeah, that's true. I think we mentioned that at the beginning of the show, that lion -O was the, well, the lord of the Thundercats. Oh, yes, yeah. But your, his character was the... Commander or the yeah Lieutenant Quicksilver uh, yeah. we called him the Lion O of the yeah. Silverhawks, which I resented deeply. Or, or old hard ass as the rest of us refer to him behind his back. <laughs> so I, I have heard Peter that you kind of regret being such a a square as Tigra. <laughs> um. Actually, no, because what people do seem to say is that he was the mature one. And he was the one who taught lion -O things. So there. <laughs> I was mature. And don't you forget it. <laughs> nye, 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 nye. No. So mature. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you've had time to experience sort of the growth of the nostalgia and bask in the glow of, of you know, the appreciation that you get. And I was curious for those of your uh, fellow voice actors who unfortunately are no longer here, uh, the Earls, uh, Hyman and Hammond, were they able to experience some of the joy that you've gotten before they passed on? Gee, I sure hope so. Uh, yeah. I, we kind of lost, I, I at least did not have much contact with uh, Earl yeah. Hammond or Earl Hyman yeah. after a few years. They, they were quite a bit older than we were. Uh, Earl Hyman especially. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Earl uh, Hyman, who played Panthro, he, uh, he was the father on the, on the Bill Cosby show. Bill Cosby's father on the show. So our, the reason I mention that is, if you remember then, he was very gray then and pretty old. So, so yeah, and then also Bob McFadden uh, became ill yeah. and, and passed away relatively Short, shortly soon. after yeah yeah uh so they never got to experience this kind have this kind no, of experience not like this. and if you also remember as i had said before thundercats went off the air for a long time yeah it, as far as we knew it was because of legal stuff company one company i think lorimar got the rights from rankin bass yeah. and then warner brothers was yeah. buying lorimar and it just seemed to take forever before it surfaced again so i, I don't think they ever got this kind of uh, feedback about yeah. it. I, I just hope that, and I think they probably knew before they passed uh, what a big hit the show was back then. Yeah, it was number one at the time. Yeah, number and one. And so we but, all but they, knew that. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I would love to think that they were able to come here places like this uh, and see, yeah. you know, the adulation, frankly, and, and the, the love that you people give us because I, I uh, have, they, both, they both deserve that. And Larry. Lynn Lipton, we haven't even mentioned Lynn. I'm getting a vision <laughs> of Earl Hammond at one of these conventions. And, you know, the, the parent bringing his little kid to see and, and meet the great, you know, Earl Hammond. And the little kid standing at the table looking up and Earl going into... <laughs> and the little kid going, crying, running away from the table. <laughs> That's what just popped into yeah, my head. <laughs> well, you remind me of uh, when... Uh, okay, we all know Mumra on the screen, right? As he was transforming. Ancient spirits of evil. <laughs> and as he got more and more involved, Mumra on screen drools, yeah. right? All that drool. Earl did that, right? He couldn't help it. It wasn't acting. He just... No, that's he, what he came would, when you're doing all he, that once stuff. Once he got up to the, you know, the, the, the apex of it, Transform this, and a spit would fly out of his mouth. 
and we would all we would all back up into the corner. In fact, I remember uh, Lynn and I, Lynn Lipton, Chitara and I, had a little joke thing going. We would look two pages ahead to see when the next time Earl was going to do the transformation thing, and we would warn each other. Next page, Earl's, Earl's going to do it, so we all just start moving back. And one day, you know the comedian Gallagher? Remember Gallagher? I had seen his show, so one day I brought a big sheet of plastic. Uh, <laughs> and just as Earl was about to do that, I held it up. And we would, when Earl would go do his gazindas, you know, when he goes into the, that transformation, and which a lot of times we would do that at the end of the show, uh, end of the recording, because we would all do vocal sound effects, the fights, the screaming, the yelling, yeah. because sometimes we would just exhaust our voices. Yeah. Um, but whenever Earl would do that, and he'd finish that, and he would make that <laughs> yeah. gesture, there are more times than, I can't tell you how many times, we would be laughing and applauding in the studio, yeah. giving Earl his props yeah. uh, for an incredible yeah. job. That's yeah. right. He would, while he was talking, he would wipe his, you know, ancient spirit of evil, transform. <laughs> Uh, what was it? One more thing about Earl. There's so many funny things about Earl, but I, I can't remember it now. But we had a lot of fun. We did. We, uh, we, we have time for one more question. So no pressure. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Thundercat Legends. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, for anyone that might be wanting to get into voice acting or other things in that kind of genre, what would your advice be going forward for anyone here that's looking to put their foot into that area? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> we, we, don't don't, need the we don't need the uh, that's right. competition. Yeah. All right. We're old. We're tired. We don't need the aggravation. Hard enough to get jobs anyway. Go Stay home. Be a bookkeeper. <laughs> Go. No, I, tell, I, I always tell them. Uh, when young people ask me, I'm talking about people still in high school or whatever, I tell them, take every speech class they offer in school, whether it's debate, um, improvisational speaking, any, any speech class you can get, any chance you can to use your voice while you're in school. Ask the football team if you can be the PA announcer at the games. Uh, ask, the, ask the principal if you can make the announcements at the end of the day. Like Don't that. ask RetroCon. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I tell younger yeah. people. But now yeah. you might be more into this than I am. Today, of course, with the Internet, you can go online and Google voice acting lessons in your town yeah. or whatever, and there are thousands of them. Just Yeah, the only thing you have to remember is that it is both a technical job and an acting job. And we uh, they still do it because you still have to fit into time. We do a reading of a 30 second you know, uh, page of copy and the, they'd say that was great but you've got a whole three quarters of a second to fill take your time three quarters of a second or could you shorten it by a half a second uh, and you, you have to learn uh, but don't make it sound faster yeah but don't make it sound <laughs> faster that's right, exactly right <laughs> make, it, make it three seconds faster cut three seconds but don't make it sound faster um, but these are the things, the, the, te the technique yeah. that you have to learn, as well as the acting. Uh, so, yeah. If, 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 if for older people, when I say who are not still in high school or whatever, if you really want to do it, Google voice cl acting classes yeah. in your area. They'll, they'll pop up. You'll see all kinds of them. Check them out because they're like in any, any other avenue, there are going to be some charlatans out there who are just after your money. You know, you're not going to get anything out of it. So check them out very carefully. But if you want to, if you want to get into the business, try it. You know, the, I always tell people that the last thing I ever wanted in my life was to get to be 75 years old, like I am now, and, and sit home and say, gee, I wish I would have tried that. Whatever it was, baseball, uh, being a voice actor or whatever. I never wanted to sit back at home and say, gee, I should have tried that. If you've got a passion for something, do it. If it doesn't work out, so what? At least you won't regret it that you didn't try. That's a wise way to end this panel, don't you think? <laughs> did you, Peter, did you have something you wanted to add? Can no, you the that? only thing I would say is this notion of trying anything if, you know, and if you need to find a job when you're young, you got to try anything sometimes. Uh, for about two days, I tried selling encyclopedias door to door. Uh, so I was willing to try just about anything. Yeah. Were you glad you tried? 
Uh, looking back, no. <laughs> <laughs> Again, everything I said. <laughs> well, that we are unfortunately out of time. Thank yeah. you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all. Thank you, round of applause. Please visit at their table. I know you'll agree with me. Thank you all for being fans. We love you so much. If it weren't for you guys, we'd be selling encyclopedias. <laughs> Thank you. We're basking. We're basking. Hey, fans. Just a reminder that those cool cats at 80stees.com sponsored this panel recording. And if you want to show your Thundercats love, you can use coupon code FSCATS and get 30% off your next order. Visit 80stees.com for all your 80s representing shirts. Head on over today. Hi, this is Gary Chalk, Optimus Prime. Please stay tuned to Fandom Spotlight. You can watch it online at any time. 